Next, on Viewpoint. In today's fast-moving culture, why are so many saying they have gotten bored with Jesus? People have a tendency to be bored with everything. People get bored with their spouses, they're bored with their kids, they're bored with their jobs. And later in the program... And I said that wherever this country is headed on the road to moral decline, families will be the first to get there. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. We live in a culture that demands change from the latest phone to the latest fashions. However, our faith rarely changes. The core book is over 2,000 years old. Content has not changed. It seems for many people are just getting bored with Jesus. And Daniel Fusco, who's a pastor of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver and Portland, he's also author of the book Upward, Inward, and Outward. Daniel, I know for many people watching who've had a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ, they could see this as impossible. Are you seeing that people are getting bored with Christ in the culture that we have right now, the, cl the climate that we have? Well, absolutely. I think culturally, given the amount of options that we have, people have a tendency to be bored with everything. People get bored with their spouses, they're bored with their kids, they're bored with their jobs, their careers. And then obviously, spiritually speaking, people, uh, we see a lot of it, that people are just getting bored with Jesus, that we always need the newest, the most innovative, the thing that we've never experienced before. And so it is a huge cultural problem right now. Is, is this an accelerating situation? I mean, if I was born a long time before you were, raised in the 50s, and uh, church was a major part of everybody's life, in my neighborhood anyway, and we had very little other things pulling us away. I mean, we had bicycles and, and sports and things like that. But today, is it, is it an increasing problem as the computers continue to, to recreate themselves and entertainment recreates itself every year? Well, I, I do think it's an increasing problem, but I also believe that the pendulum is already swinging back. I mean, you already see movements going on, like things like minimalism, where in a world full of option, people are saying, all of this stuff is not making me happy, so I'm going to start to choose to, to utilize less. Uh, you have all the research coming out now about the, the digital addiction and the digital distractions. And then you have these great and very popular works about how we have to return to the art of deep work rather than just being uh, in the shallows of life. We need to return the ability to, to focus and do deep work. So I already see in some ways uh, our culture is beginning to react to uh, it always needs to be new, glitzy, something that's brand new because we realize that at, we're, we're amusing ourselves to death. We're, we're really amusing ourselves into uh, a melancholy culturally and it's, uh, and it's not working. And so I already see the pendulum starting to swing back, but for lots of people, you know, we're seeing here in the Pacific Northwest, lots of people who never walked with Jesus are really fascinated and they're really loving Jesus. And, but for people who grew up in it, it is always a struggle because, as you said, uh, Jesus doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible doesn't change. It's been canonized for a couple thousand years. And uh, so these things don't change. But we really want to learn how to interface with Jesus and the scriptures in, in, in an increasingly deep way. And so uh, kind of a shallow, cursory approach doesn't really get us uh, to where we want to be. Does the church have to, have to begin to emulate what uh, modern culture is doing as far as entertainment and grabbing people's attention? Well, what I would say is that, uh, no, we don't need to emulate the culture, but we also don't, we shouldn't be naive. So here's the thing. One of the things that we always say is that God deserves our very best, right? Things like we give him the first fruits. We, we you know, when they were to offer a sacrifice uh, in the children of Israel at the time of Moses, they would always take a flawless sacrifice. And so the idea is that God deserves our very best. Now, uh, because we live in a day and age of auto-tuned vocals, uh, very produced music, uh, if you're going to offer music at your church, if it's not done really, really well, I mean, most people would rather listen to something that's actually done really well. And so I think, but we don't do it to emulate the culture. We do it as an act of worship. So one of the things that, and I'm blessed to be part of the Crossroads family, we have so many gifted people who do things extraordinarily, but they don't just do it for it to be good. They do it as an act of worship to God. And so uh, I always tell our team that we are fighting against, someone can choose to either engage at a ministry of Crossroads or they can go home and binge watch Netflix or, or, or Amazon Prime. And because of that, what we offer them has to be 
authentic and substantial. It's not good enough just to offer it and it not be well planned, well executed. Uh, but we don't do it just so that we can have them be there. We do it as unto the Lord and we hope that people get the benefit. Well, do, you, do you feel like we, the church needs to be competitive in this, in the, in this arena? I, I just heard about uh, Taylor Swift. She did a concert in, in a Midwest city. 96 semis showed up with, with all of the gear and all the pyrotechnics and all of the, uh, the stuff that goes with her show. 96 semis worth of stuff to get people's attention, to, get, to entertain 65,000 people. Does the church feel like it needs to be competitive with this type of thing? Well, I mean, I think there are some churches that, that absolutely uh, just feel that they need to be competitive. I personally don't think it's wise in any way. And here's why. Because all that stuff is superficial. I mean, like, like and, and, and I'm not saying Taylor Swift is superficial. Uh, she's actually a, a, a great songwriter and she's got staying power and all those things. But really all they're offering is a couple hour concert. And, and Jesus isn't just offering just like a couple hour experience. He's offering life and life more abundantly. And so really, I think what the church has to do is it, what the church is, the churches that are trying to compete with uh, an experience laden culture, you, you spend a lot of energy uh, only f to, to try and give people fast food when you ask them to run a marathon. And, and I think that people really want to have authentic experiences. I think that you don't need all the glitz and glamour. People, like what I'll tell people is that no matter what your programming is, if, if God shows up at your worship service, there's a lot of people who are going to get blown away by that. And that doesn't cost anything. It really costs us time and prayer, seeking God's heart. And so I think that the church wants to give people experiences, but not as the world does. But we want to give people truly authentic experiences with Jesus, with His Spirit. And when that happens, I'm here to tell you, when, when, when Jesus and the Spirit show up in the midst of a group of people, it blows people's minds. And we get to see that often here at Crossroads, which is, I think, one of the reasons why God is uh, growing the ministry and, and doing the work He's doing here in such a unique way. It's, it's more than competitive with 96 semis full of glitz. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Individually, how do, we, how do we keep from getting bored? I mean, there's people that, that are in your congregation at Crossroads. They're there every week, maybe two or three times a week. Uh, how do you keep them fired up? Is it, is it the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are there things that the church does to keep that staff involved? How do you keep from getting bored with the, with, with the work? Well, so and that's a great question. And, and so I think it is a combination of a number of things. Obviously, uh, nothing that we do apart from the finished work of Jesus and the power of the Spirit is going to do anything. I mean, if, if it says in the Psalms that if the, if the, if the Lord doesn't uh, build the house, the, the people who build labor in vain. And, and if the Lord doesn't watch the city, then the watchers, they wait in vain. And, and so really, we realize that God has to do it. But there's lots of things that we can do. We always say at Crossroads that God has knobs on his side of the wall and God is perfect at tuning those knobs, taking care of that business. But there are knobs on our side of the wall. So for us at Crossroads, whether our, our, our large family gathering on Sundays, we want to make sure that uh, it is uh, led by the Spirit, that uh, the teaching is not only biblically rigorous, but uh, also uh, connect with people right where they are. As we go through the week, obviously our own programming, whether we're having people go to men's ministry or women's ministry, or they go to a community group, or they go to recovery, or they go to some of the different care ministries that we have. We want to make sure that we're helping people see this. If you want to really hit the bullseye spiritually, this is how we encourage you to get at as well as serving self-sacrificially in our community. But really the key to not being bored with Jesus, it's not uh, the church has a responsibility for solid programming to really offer what we would consider to be great biblical discipleship. That would be the Bible way to say it. But uh, it really boils down to the individual. So I always tell someone if they say, I wonder if I'm bored with Jesus. First, if you're bored, you have to acknowledge that boredom. You have to, you have to confess that boredom. You know, uh, we see that in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus writing that letter to the church in Ephesus. He said, look, you know, you have all these things that are going good, but you've left your first love. And, he, you know, first he, he, he counseled them to, to repent, which means to change your direction. But before you change direction, you have to acknowledge where you are, like the prodigal son who realized when he was it, it, uh, tending to pigs, he was looking at the pig's food, he was saying, hey, this looks really delicious, and he knew this was not, he's in a bad spot. You know, it begins with him acknowledging where he is. So if you're bored, I say acknowledge, okay, God, you know I'm bored right now. 
and then you change. You, you change direction. And so uh, to the church in Ephesus, Jesus said that you should repent and do the first works. So, so you change direction. You go back to doing what you used to do. I call that returning where, you know, there was a time when you weren't born with Jesus, you were showing up early for church, you were serving, you loved to worship, you would listen to, to praise music during the week, you'd read the Bible, and not just read uh, a chapter or, or a, a part of a chapter, but you were, reading the, you were reading the cover off the book. Go back, start doing that again. Re-engage in, in serving self-sacrificially in your church and in your community. And, uh, and spending time praising God. And then when that happens, then you begin to rejoice because what I'm here to tell you is, is God is not boring. I always say, if you're bored, it's not God's fault. God is the most amazing, unique, adventurous person you will ever meet. He is the kindest, most loving, most joyful, most intelligent person who's ever lived. And so God's definitely not boring. You know, and I have people say, well, I think the Bible's boring. I'm like, well, you're not reading it. The Bible is extraordinary from a literary perspective, from a theological perspective, and there's some pretty crazy stories in there as well that can capture your imagination. And so for me, uh, we're responsible to making sure that we're not bored. You know, so that's, the, that's kind of the way that I get at it. Well, with, with the growth of, of Crossroads Ministry, I mean, you've got a, a, a brick and mortar church. With the growth of that ministry, worldwide actually on the internet is there any concern that people are going to start staying home and watching Daniel on TV or on the internet well now that's a great question and before we started our internet campus which people can check out if they want it's crossroadslive.tv mm -hmm. um, the big question was is if we do this are people going to stop coming and here's what I've learned there are some people who they're going to stop coming but it's a small percentage what I've also realized is that lots of people who call Crossroads home they're not there for good reasons. They have sick kids, they're traveling, there's all sorts of reasons. And so as a pastor, I'm creating these series that I want them to go through, taking them through books of the Bible. But there are, you know, the average churchgoer only makes it to church about two out of four Sundays a month because different things go on. So there's lots of people who call Crossroads Home it's not that they don't want to be there or they're just slacking off or being lazy spiritually. They can't be there for legitimate reasons. And so they start to tune in on the internet campus so they can keep up with what's going on. But what we didn't realize is that there are all sorts of people in the world who are interested in Jesus, but for whatever reason, they've never gone to church. It's like the most uncomfortable thing in the world. Like the last place I'd ever want to go is go to church. And by offering the internet campus, what we've learned, especially where we are in the Portland metro area, is that there are all sorts of people here who've never been to church in their entire life. Like it's not that they're de-church, they've never been to church before. And they're fascinated by Jesus. And so they start watching Crossroads on the internet campus, and then they start getting ministered to. The time in worship, the time in the Word, they start getting, they develop an appetite for the things of God. And then before you know it, they're connecting with our hosts on our internet campus. They're saying, hey, I'm going to come to church for the very first time. And our hosts who are there will come and greet them, tell them where to meet up, give them a cup of coffee, say, hey, we'll come sit with you in the service. And those people are giving their lives to Jesus and starting that journey. And so we didn't realize the extraordinary evangelistic opportunity that the internet campus is and has become for us. It's one of the single greatest drivers of all of the, the, the growth of people becoming converted to follow Jesus, all because of the stuff we do digitally. So we've only not only not seen people not come, Crossroads has only grown uh, in people coming onto campus while the internet stuff continues to explode and impact. And once again, the address of the internet church? It's crossroadslive.tv, or we stream all of our services live on Facebook at the Crossroads Facebook page, which is go, go the number two Crossroads. So G-O, the number two Crossroads, that's our Facebook page, and we have lots of people catching it there as well. Well, Daniel, thank you for being with us again. He's the author of Upward, Inward, and Outward. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbors. Daniel, has been great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate y'all. Thanks so much. Coming up next. What if, there, what if there's that person out there right now? There's a lady who's, who's had an abortion, maybe two or three. Yeah. And she feels condemned. Yes. How do, how do you speak to her? Oh, my God. This is a woman who is a candidate for the love of God. Our guest, Bill Harris, helps us sort it all out. Next. We hear a lot about family. What is family? The image has changed quite a bit in the past 20 years, past three decades, from mom and dad to same-sex couples. What does the Bible say about what a family is, what marriage is? Bill Harris is with us today. He's a former TV journalist. 
He also teaches a lot of seminars. Now you've got a lot more time because you've decided to retire. Yes, yes. <laughs> We're glad to have you with us today. Happy to be here. How does the, how does the Bible define what a family is, what marriage is. It defines it as that between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. God first gave Adam a job, then he gave him his wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to learn there. But, but here's the fact, it's, he said that uh, they would be as one. Mm -hmm. And even when you get into the sexual intimacy, Bob, when two people come together sexually, there's a oneness there. And so we have to do things God's way. And what I see that is taking place is a, a tremendous attack on the family. Years ago in my early uh, career at Channel 13 in Toledo, I was asked to testify before the White House Conference on Families in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I said that wherever this country is headed on the road to moral decline, families yeah. will be the first to get there. You know, I, I heard described one time that, that uh, Adam and Eve, or a husband and wife, mm -hmm. were the smallest pillars of a church. I mean, you got this relationship, uh, they, they come together, they're the smallest pillars of the church. And ever since that happened, the enemy's been out to destroy oh, that yeah. because that's the body of Christ that's falling it. apart. That's it. And you see, even in society today, many sociologists will tell you this. If there is a breakdown in the family, it's just a matter of time before it's going to have an impact on the family. Just mm -hmm. a matter of time. Now, is, is the word marriage, is that, is that a scriptural word? Is that Gee, that's a good God? question. I've mm -hmm. never heard that question mm -hmm. before. I don't know. Did no. God define it? Yeah, oh well, yeah, there's a definition of it between the man and the woman because two become one flesh. Mm -hmm. And that, that, of course, spiritually, where the husband and the wife are lost in one another and they become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So we have these, these, the same sex attraction between two people. Yeah. And uh, they decide to get married. It's a union. Mm -hmm. We know it's a union. And they're good people. They're wonderful people. Oh, yeah. It's a union. that Can God bless that union? Can and, he? And now, he, he can't bless something that is against his word mm -hmm. because God honors his word highest above all. In fact, in, in uh, one scripture, I think it's Psalm 138 two, God says he honors his word even above his name. Yeah. So he can't break with that. What's happening, and I have to say, it, I have to put it this way, but I have to preface it by saying that this is not a put down. This is just to tell you the gospel truth. There is a satanic attack on the family and the way God has created us. And there is in the minds of some people mm -hmm. this belief that a man can be attracted to a man and that a woman can be attracted to a woman. There is even the belief among some parents that, well, my child, although he was, you know, created a, a male, has these tendencies toward female. Mm -hmm. And I will let him decide which way he, he wants is. to go. Well, we don't let our children decide which way they want to go for education. You're going to get an education. Yeah. That's all there's to I mean, how can we leave something so delicate uh, as a decision on sex, sexual identity to that child when the child doesn't have enough knowledge to know? It is the parent's responsibility to teach that child. Now, we have that attack on what we call traditional family, God's mm -hmm, family. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that, that the enemy is doing to attack family right now? Or well, it has been in the last several generations. Anyway. I think divorce is one of the biggest ones. And, and, but, but, but on the other hand, we have to be careful because some churches shun people who are divorced. And God wants us to love them. God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate those people. Right. You know, and, and big we, difference. It's a big difference there. So the <coughs> divorce is, is one of the, one, another one of the, the biggest things that we have. But let's take the onslaught of the, the drug problem in this mm -hmm. country uh, with marijuana laws being relaxed in many of the states across this country. I just did some uh, preliminary research trying to get into this more uh, that they are researching now the impact that marijuana use is having on the brains of young children. Well, because, there's an yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because the brain is continuing to develop even into the early 20s. Mm -hmm. And think of these young people that think it's okay. I mean, some people actually think, Bob, that, 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 that marijuana is nature's way of saying hi. hi. You know, <laughs> it is hi, yeah. You know, and it, it's not well, a good hi. Let, let me say this, mm -hmm. and I don't say, I, please don't take it to condemnation. I say this to protect. It's like a sign out there on the road that says, danger, 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 you're warning people. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want to say. I got this from a Christian psychologist, dear friend of mine. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will charge you more than you want to pay. When That's we, absolutely, yeah. yeah. When we change our laws in society, Bob, because we no longer feel that we can um, 
crack the case on crime and so far as drugs and the like. Mm -hmm. So if we decriminalize it, now we don't have well, the crime. Yeah. See, when we do that, we're opening the door for the enemy to come in and destroy lives. There's, there's a good example of that right now is the lady that was running for mayor of San Francisco and they were passing out needles to all of these junkies on the yeah, streets yeah. so that they wouldn't be using, cross-using needles yeah. and getting hepatitis and all kinds of things. Exactly. So to stop the disease, they gave them all clean needles. Well, now there's needles all over the streets of San Francisco. Yeah. They want to clean that up. So she says the way she's going to do that is by opening safe injection sites. So she's going to open up rooms where these guys can go and get, yeah. get high. So we, 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 we can't solve the problem, therefore we make the problem bigger yeah. by allowing people to do those things. Yeah. And, 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 and it's going to backfire on us. Because has, the reason yeah. God has told us not to do these things is, is, is not because he wants to prevent us from having right. fun. God is trying to protect us from the consequences mm -hmm. of evil and sin. That's what God is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the prices we're paying is the, is the breakdown of the family. I, I, I think you agree that uh, back in the 70s, Roe versus Wade There's has another done, done a, 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 just a huge attack mm -hmm. on the family. Look at the number of, a number of children that have been destroyed, the generations yeah. that aren't mm -hmm. going to be there even in, from a practical standpoint to pay taxes yeah. for you and I to be retired. God <laughs> has never given the right yeah. for a mother to decide whether her child will live or die. That but it's her body. But th that's, that's the argument. Right? It's her body. That's her body. I She's come back with the fact that that body inside of her is another body mm -hmm. that she has no say-so over. Uh, when you look at the fact that Jeremiah talked about the fact that um, God called him when he was a fetus in his mother's womb. He was in his mother's he womb. He called him at that you know? And so. Here, we're, we're debating over whether or not a fetus is a human being, and God didn't wait for Jeremiah to grow right. up and go off to seminary school. He called him when he was a, a fetus mm -hmm. in his mother's womb. You know, and today, mother's womb has become death row for millions of unborn babies. And we're not speaking out on it enough. I mean, yeah, it's been around for a long time, but, and when I say speaking out, I don't mean to condemn. We have got to use the word of God to educate and get at people yeah, and bring hope. If we will just believe what the Bible says, if we will share God's word, there is a power and an anointing that goes with God's word that doesn't condemn, it convicts. See, there's a difference between condemning and convicting. When you're condemning, you're pushing somebody down to the ground, hoping they never okay. get up again. What if, God there, wants what if to there's that person out there right now? There's a lady who's, who's had an abortion, maybe two or three, yeah. and she feels condemned. Yes. How do, how do you speak to her? Oh, my God. I, I've even said it in my program. This is a woman who is a candidate for the love of God. Mm -hmm. If you've done these terrible, deplorable things, there is enough power in the blood of Jesus to wash the slate clean and forgive you if you will just come to him and confess it. I don't care what you have done. And you may have come to the realization that, you know, sometimes a woman on the anniversary of when the child was to be born, sometimes women have uh, uh, emotional problems mm -hmm. about that. But the Lord will forgive you of all of that that you have done including taking the life of your unborn child. And the Lord will bless you and, give, and, and help you to flourish in your future. What about the man who abandoned her? <laughs> that man, if he is willing to recognize mm -hmm. that he did a terrible thing in abandoning her, because it takes two, you know? Absolutely. It's just like when they brought the woman who caught, was caught in adultery. Yeah, where to was the man? Where was the guy? Yeah, where, where was, was this guy? guy, you know? Yeah. Well, in this case, the man or the boy that is abandoned, if he will come forth, forth as, a, as, as a man, mm -hmm and honor God and say, I was wrong in doing this. Honor the, 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 the woman that he impregnated. I left you, I abandoned you, I should not have done that. I'm sorry for that and, and ask for God. So he for needs forgiveness. To, there needs to be reconciliation. There has to be reconciliation. There has to be repentance and confession comes from the mouth. Mm -hmm. Confession comes from the mouth and we have to confess to the Lord that we have sinned and, and, and ask for his forgiveness. But it comes immediately when we do that. You know, it doesn't, there's no bolt of lightning that in the heavens don't shake when it happens, but on the inside, you become a brand new creature. So whatever you have done, it's nothing so deplorable that the Lord can't forgive you from can it. There, can there be restoration? Can we, is there hope for the family? Can we get back what we've lost, what, we, what we've intentionally destroyed in mm -hmm, some cases? Mm -hmm. Can we get back? We can we, because this is God's. And within this culture. Yes, yes, this is God's order for the family. Mm -hmm. Remember, God is the author He's of the family. He's more powerful than our current culture. Yeah, because, you know, the, the marriage didn't come about as an edict from the Supreme Court. It was not an act of Congress. Yeah. It was not an executive order from the president. It's an act of God. Yeah. 
when we click into what God's word says, just like God saved the nation when Jonah finally got his act together. Yeah. <laughs> and he, went, he didn't want it. But he it didn't happened. want it. But when he finally got his act together and told, told the story and ministered to that nation, they turned in a day. They turned back to God in a day. That can happen here. God is not standing over America with a baseball bat ready to club us down because of all these sins we've done here in this country. Sometimes I think he should be. Well, <laughs> we, 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 in our own yeah. personal judgments, yeah. we do. I, I have that same feeling, Bob. Mm -hmm. I have that same feeling sometimes. I don't but want to be the judge. But. He is a loving God. And when I think about what all he forgave me for, goodness, mm -hmm. why wouldn't he forgive somebody else? Right. When you think about what all he forgave you for, you know, Absolutely. and then we continue to stumble. Sometimes we get it wrong and we ask God to forgive us and he does and he takes us back and we just keep mm -hmm. right on going on as if it never happened. And then when we get before God on the judgment day and they open the book with our name on it, instead of seeing all that nasty stuff you and I did, it's going to be blotches of blood. Just wipe wow. it all away gone. Today you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page. I'm Bob Placey. Join me on the next Viewpoint.